So first I have to apologize because I realize I'm, I'm chopping away from the coffee break, which is a unforeseen, um, unforgivable sin. Anyone who should prefer to leave, please uh, do. Uh, those who can endure me, I'll try to describe a bit of the follow-up that we do with relativistic explosions. And this is, of course, not my own work. Uh, I, this, there has been a huge collaboration in the years, uh, and some of the people are in this room. Some, in, I highlighted some that were the PIs of this program over the years. Uh, so relativistic explosion, uh, with this expression, I tried to put together two, two kind of sources that are, however, very uh, related. And uh, so one is gamma reversed, and one is uh, gravitational wave sources, specifically mergers of uh, binary compact objects. And there is a, 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 a very interesting connection between these two sources that has been theorized over the years, and then it was confirmed in 2017. So gamma reversed actually come in two species, in two, fa uh, in two classes. One is the long burst based on their durations, and one is the short. And, and they have a different physical ori origin, despite they, they show up in a similar manner uh, if, as uh, an electromagnetic phenomenon. But uh, long come from the collapse of massive stars, so young, hot, uh, big stars that collapse. And the short come from the mergers of uh, binary compact objects, so maybe two neutron stars or a neutron star and black hole or two black holes. Uh, and, and these systems are also uh, gravitational wave sources. So when the LIGO and Virgo detectors uh, uh, made their, own, their thing and they, they find a new source, it's, uh, it's from two compact objects emerging, and associated to this gravitational event, there is also a, a gamma reverse. Um, so this basically <laughs> repeats what I said, like if you check the distribution of the duration of gamma reverse, you see that you have a bimodal distribution, you have two big groups, uh, and, it, and like the dividing line on the duration is two seconds. So the short ones are those that we think are due to mergers, and the long ones are due to collapsing stars. And we can do different kind of physics and astronomy studying these two classes of events. And yes, okay. The connection between uh, short burst and uh, uh, gravitational wave mergers have been demonstrated at least for one event. Here you see a gamma ray light curve of, from the Fermi and integral satellites. You see there is a, 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 a gamma ray burst, so like an XX of emission out of the, the background. At the, like once, two seconds after the famous uh, gravitational wave events from uh, uh, August 2017, uh, where the LIGO detector detected for the first time the merger of two neutron stars, and immediately after we saw this uh, electromagnetic signal. So at least for this gamma ray burst, a short gamma ray burst, uh, the connection is proved beyond doubt. Uh, we have massive uh, secondary lines of evidence to connect the old population of short bursts to, uh, to mergers of, uh, of events, but this is clearly a new field, and maybe there is uh, some details that we are still not getting incomplete. So one, one term that you will hear in the rest of the talk is this kilonova. So when you have two neutron stars that merge together, they, they make, uh, they explode in the, in the contact, they, they release some of the, uh, the material in a, in a shell of debris, they create a, 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 a torus or a disk around the merging uh, uh, objects, and you also can produce a wind from the accretion disk. So all this material uh, is uh, the remnant, is uh, expelled into space, and it glows, which is very important for us because we can see it, and one of the key features is that in this, this is a very strange material. It's a neutron-rich material from the neutron star that gets converted into a heavy element. So this is a quite important uh, because it's a, believed to be a significant site of production of the element, uh, of the R process elements. That, so, um, and, the, and the presence of these elements, uh, beyond being interesting in itself, because uh, then you can make uh, gold rings or, or whatever you want to do, uh, is also that it imprints a very distinctive spectral signature on the uh, kilonova because uh, they have a very, very high opacity. So they they some of the region, the, the regions rich with the lanthanides and these heavy elements, they, they, they are extremely red. So they are basically not visible in the optical, they're only visible in the infrared. While other regions of the kilonova are blue, so you have a complex phenomenology, but uh, a, a, a very important uh, signature of this kilonova is the presence of a very red component which is actually very a sort of a, a smoking gun to, to detect kilonovae. 
So like uh, now that I've seen like uh, the GLB follow-up uh, started uh, not uh, long ago, uh, like the first uh, uh, GLB afterglow, the optical emission from the gamma reversed back in 97, uh, so 25 years ago, something like that, already saw the participation of Danish astronomers and one not astronomer, and there were uh, not data included in, the, in this paper. And since then, um, like uh, it, it has, it has been a, a quite quite a, a, a fruitful business. Um, so, like uh, in 25 years, like uh, about 350 afterglows have been observed. Uh, so there is maybe 30 350 of you that were annoyed because we were you were observing something else, and the, the gamma ray burst uh, suddenly happened. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll hope to, to to explain why it was worth. Uh, like uh, uh, we also secured the several redshift. Uh, so the redshift uh, is usually typically something that is left to bigger telescopes, like like the VLT or Gemini. Uh, but like uh, the not, I, I would say it it, it managed it distinguished the, with a fair amount of uh, spectroscopy for a uh, two meter class telescope. Um, uh, so, so, like, it, it, it has given a non-negligible contribution to, to, uh, to the uh, GRB um, amount of data that we have uh, collected worldwide. Another uh, very effective business that has been happened in the, especially in like, the last decade, was the follow-up of the supernovae associated to the long GRBs. I mentioned uh, the long GRBs come from, uh, from massive stars, and so you, you see the supernova evolution uh, beyond the uh, gamma ray burst presence, and this has uh, allowed us to find constraints on, on the exploding stars, the stars that generate gamma ray burst. But now I would like to say one thing that uh, uh, maybe it doesn't always sound uh, grandiose, but uh, I think the NOT is a great enabling facility. So it has uh, many of the observations that we secure the NOT are uh, the base for follow-up campaigns, and I will show some of them. But like uh, this is not a non-trivial task. It's it's a very solid foundation uh, that we managed to to use to 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 trigger other programs to do more in-depth uh, follow-up. Uh, in particular, like uh, we collaborate with the Stargate collaboration at ESO, uh, which uses the VLT, and uh, and it's a it's a very important resource for us to have access to the knot that gives us. Uh, uh, the magnitudes of the targets that we try to trigger on, and uh, and and gives uh, pre-selects uh, interesting targets, and uh, so like we we for us it's a very important uh, uh, contribution. And I would say that there is also recognition worldwide, like uh, in speaking with uh, GRB colleagues uh, like uh, uh, around the world from um, the US and so on. Like it's it's a it's a very well-known uh, contribution that that the NOT brings. So like. Why do do I need to affect you? Uh, why do GRB astronomers need to affect you when when we observe? Is the fact that the the, the bursts are very very bright at the beginning? You can see magnitude ranging from 15 to 10, or some exceptional cases even brighter. But this lasts very short, lasts maybe half an hour, one hour, or uh, so. In in these very first early stages, we have a, a a very bright afterglow which is completely accessible to the to the to the knot and uh, we, we can get high quality data for these events. Uh, but there is also a physical reason. Um, basically, the gamma ray burst work uh, logarithmically. So let's say between uh, 10 minutes and 20 minutes in the, in the GRB lifetime is the same as between one day and two days. So with, uh, with 10 minutes observation, you, you are spanning like a, 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 double, a doubling time of the life of the, of the object. So, so you get a lot of information if you manage to get as soon as possible. And often, uh, after several hours, maybe they become too faint and, and, and not feasible. Uh, so like uh, one of the things that we also like uh, look forward to with uh, the upcoming of NT is the rapid response mode. This would be a way to um, minimize the uh, delay between the explosion of the GDB and the observation. And uh, like this is a technique already implemented of some telescopes, especially, for example, in Chile. But this plot shows you a little bit of a problem that Chile has. Uh, these uh, strange uh, uh, contours uh, on top of the map of the world represent the so-called South Atlantic anomaly. So uh, it's, a, it's a region in the sky where uh, there is high background uh, in, in from, from cosmic rays. So whenever the Swift satellite is going in through its orbit, it, when it passes on top of that, it has to switch off because it would uh, get no useful data and possibly damage the instruments. 
So basically, any time that shift is on top of Chile, cr crucially, it's not detecting burst. So of course, there are some like maybe that are still visible. The, well, the field of view is wide and so on. But like uh, uh, Chile is unfortunately a bad place to to get a rapid response because there will not be burst promptly visible. But the Canary Islands are in, much in a much better situation. So we expect like that there is a, a larger number of triggers uh, uh, visible from here. And, and this is, a, I think, it's a precious resource compared to, to, to other locations. Um, yes. Uh, this is an example, however, despite, uh, like, uh, with what we have, like, this is a fairly recent. Uh, we got uh, this uh, afterglow. It's a spectrum at redshift 5.6, so fairly. OK, nowadays, uh, I don't know, high redshift is 10 or whatever, but still, uh, it's, a, it's a good, uh, I'll, I'll show briefly. Like, so you see, this is a spectrum taken with Alphosk in which you, you, we see the whole, the whole picture. This big, uh, this is the, the trace, the signal of the spectrum. This is the 2D spectrum. So we have red here and blue here. So the wavelength direction is, is, is spread in this direction. And this big uh, gap, you see, there's no light. It's due to the absorption of hydrogen. Is, uh, it's a damp and laminar absorption system. But you can see uh, here there is continuum from the afterglow, and then you have uh, little uh, blips, which are absorption features from metals. And this part, instead, is absorption from new, uh, neutral IgM at lower redshift. Uh, it's called the Lyman forest. And if you put this in a more consumable way, is a, like one, two spectrum, you see that uh, this is the fitted afterglow spectrum. This part is completely uh, um, killed by the uh, the intergalactic uh, hydrogen, but this is due, this uh, this profile is due to the hydrogen in the JDB Hans galaxy, and these are the absorption lines from various metals. So you can see that here we can, in principle, measure both the hydrogen content and the metal content for various species. So this would lead to a key to to measure the uh, metallicity, like which is the ratio of how much metals to hydrogen we have. So one issue is that the resolution of Alphosk is uh, not sufficient to do this uh, in, uh, in, in an accurate manner because the line profile has needs to be resolved. And there are the degeneracy between the velocity profile of the line and the column density. So like uh, uh, with NTE, like uh, with, with Alphosk, we, we, we get the redshift, we get some basic measurements. But with NTE that will uh, have a higher resolution, we'll make a step forward and really uh, be able to measure detailed property of, uh, of the medium. And this is an example of what, what is we have been doing in the years. So you see, this, the top panel is a metal over hydrogen, so the metallicity, as a function of redshift. And uh, you see, the, all the uh, blue point is gamma ray burst. Uh, this is a sample obtained with the VLT, uh, because as, as I mentioned, like it's not possible to measure this uh, specific uh, uh, feature with what we, with our regular setup at the, at the north. And uh, but you can, uh, the, the, the gold points are quasar, uh, so measurement due to quasars. But you see that the gamma ray burst allowed to extend the at, at the higher redshift. So this is a fairly recent result from uh, uh, September of last year. Like, uh, and it's one of the highest redshift uh, for which a, a quantitative accurate metallicity measurement has been possible. And this is the uh, metal over hydrogen, while this one is the dust to metal. So another important component of the interstellar medium is the dust. So how much of the metals go into uh, like micro, micro particles and, and dust. So you see, again, this is uh, something that allows to extend these to redshift that are not, uh, uh, we cannot probe with, uh, with the quasars. So like uh, basically, uh, high redshift GRBs produce, uh, like allow to measure metal, dust, hydrogen molecules, the full picture of the interstellar medium. Um, yes. So I just would like to mention that uh, you will probably think, OK, but there's very few measurements at Redshift 6. I say, yeah, it's fair enough. It's not an easy business. So uh, this has not been, it's still like the only way to populate uh, that, that part. But like uh, there is good news because uh, uh, there is a forthcoming GRB mission, which is called SVOM which uh, is optimized to detect higher redshift burst in, in that it will detect uh, um, softer gamma rays that are, in principle, uh, uh, gamma ray burst at higher redshift will be redshifted, so the gamma rays will become softer. And so the, this forthcoming mission is, uh, uh, is uh, more sensitive to soft burst, and it has also an onboard uh, um, uh, 
optical monitor optical, uh, that reaches far into the red, so that in principle is uh, able directly to, de to detect uh, the optical uh, counterparts, and also has an orbital solution that is optimized to, uh, to, be, to detect bursts that are visible at a specific time. So while a current satellite detects many of the bursts are not visible, uh, all the SVOM detect the bursts should become visible from uh, when they explode. So it, it should increase significantly the number of, uh, of uh, objects that we are allowed uh, to see. Uh, I feel that uh, maybe I can skip something so that uh, yes, but I, I just wanted to mention this other result, which is also fairly uh, uh, recent. It's from a, a Gillian Lastingjad uh, in uh, Northwestern University, but this is what I consider a great example of the not as an enabler instruments. So this was a gamma ray burst from last December in which uh, if you see in this plot of duration, it's uh, exactly in the, mid in the middle. It's exactly the prototypical gamma ray burst, long gamma ray burst. And, uh, uh, but like uh, what, what happens, I'm, I'm not going into the details, like uh, so we, we did not try to observe it right away and uh, we could see the afterglow. And you see it's very close to a galaxy, but not quite on top of, of, of it. And uh, normally long gamma ray bursts are always uh, hot on top of, uh, of, of the Rose galaxy. So this, while the long, the short burst, the, those due to mergers, it, it, and that's no problem. They easily can uh, move away from the galaxy because the, it takes a longer time to, for, the, for the system to merge, so they have time to travel away after the system formed. So it's quite common to have such an offset for short merged induced bursts, but not from long. And then we took also spectrum, and the spectrum has a property that is uh, basically featureless. So you think, oh, okay, that's boring, but actually we always detect lines. So the fact that we didn't this time tells us one thing, that the lines should not be there, specifically that the redshift should be so low that the, the metal lines that are in the UV do not enter the optical range. So this is a confirmation, an indirect confirmation that this burst is also associated with this galaxy, which is uh, very close at the redshift 0.076. Uh, so, like, uh, they're not allowed to point out to these strange events. So, it, it, it is long, but it has some properties, like the environment is uh, what we would expect for a merger event. So, this is very strange. And, and then, the, then we trigger the, uh, uh, I, I'll cut the story short, but basically, uh, with uh, many other telescopes uh, went in the race, like uh, uh, larger telescopes for, for detecting a fairly uh, faint counterpart, but, we detect a kilonova. And this is fairly unique because the kilonova is what is the signal to the smoking gun of the merger burst, and merger bursts are the short ones. So the detection of the kilonova uh, clears this doubt that we had before, uh, that like it's strange, the environment is what we expect for a, long, for a short burst, uh, even if the burst was long. So the conclusion is that some of the long bursts uh, are still produced by mergers which is a, a challenge to a paradigm which has established in the 90s, but clearly and, uh, there is a small fraction of these events that the, the, the long bursts that still produce, uh, they are produced by mergers. And this is something which uh, theorists have to work on, and also in principle, it means that these are also gravitational wave uh, source candidates, so they can also uh, contribute to the detection rate from LIGO and Virgo. So like, uh, so this is one of these unexpected surprises that we find with, uh, with this uh, like patient work that you have to go to all, all, all burst to, uh, to see what happens. Um, coming to real, like, to, like the, what we said before was uh, we are convinced that it's a kilonova, but like there is one kilonova that uh, we are certain. It comes from this uh, gravitational event, uh, gravitational wave event in, in August 2017. And uh, unfortunately, like th that got a very, very much, a lot of follow-up, but it was very badly observable from the north. So uh, all the follow-up happened basically from the south. And in the very first night when the kilonova was discovered, uh, we managed to, to get a, 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 an image in K-band. I remember it was a like, larger mass in 10 minutes uh, before twilight. And still we, we managed to detect the, the object. And uh, like, so like the knot has uh, its own uh, little point in this uh, nice light curve. And then this contributed to, of course, to a great campaign that was carried out worldwide. Uh, unfortunately, not could not physically have a, 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 a large role in this. 
but it was still uh, nice to, to, be, to be part of this, and, uh, and it was like uh, this watershed event. And from the light curve, of course, people and the theories that fitted and found the parameters, the masses of, this, uh, of, the, of the neutron stars merging and, uh, and the, the amount of uh, uh, heavy elements produced. So this, this was, of course, what we need to, to build up. So, uh, see, so the difference with, uh, between gamma ray bursts and gravitational wave counterparts is that, unfortunately, the LIGO Virgo detectors uh, are, uh, um, produce very, very large error box. Oops. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. But this shows that I'm basically done. So. No? So, um, so like uh, the, these are the error localization of some of the, of the objects. You see that encompass, en encompass a large part of the, of the sky. So it's a, it, we don't know where to look for an optical contact, but we have some clues. But uh, so like we have devised some strategies. Oh, come on. OK, so OK, so there are basically two, two strategies. If you have a big telescope with, a, uh, with, sorry, a telescope with a big field of view, you just try to tile the entire error area. But the knot is not made for this. There is a Goto if you are in La Palma. There is a ZTF. There is a Panstars. But like uh, there is another strategy. So we expect these systems coming from massive galaxies. So you can also say, well, let's look inside the error box. How many big galaxies? Like uh, if we can, if we assume that uh, the, um, the number of these events is proportional to the mass, we, and we have galaxy catalogs, we can rank galaxies in the error area. And, uh, um, and only follow up those galaxies, those objects, or prioritize those. And so this is the strategy that we are trying to implement uh, uh, um, uh, with our program, at least, because it's unfeasible to cover everything. But like, uh, for example, the, this uh, supernova, uh, the, this kilonova 2017 GFO, was if you created uh, uh, this ranked list, it, it is either first or third, depending on assumption, in the, in the list of the galaxies that you would like to try. So the, it's a very, it, for the one case that we know, it was a successful uh, uh, enterprise. Of course, it's, uh, it depends on how complete are the galaxy catalogs and uh, also how large still is the error box. This was one of the events with the uh, tightest uh, localization. So basically, uh, there's not been much progress. There has been an observing run in 2019, 2020, which unfortunately did not lead to any viable uh, um, event that we could follow up from the knot. So we are eagerly waiting the next run that is starting in December, even if now, of course, I hear that there could be delays by a few months, but we are still in the, in the situation. So basically, what can we do with the knot? Uh, well, the first thing is that, as I say, like we can do this automated follow-up. It was already implemented for the previous observing run. We auto-generate all the galaxy list, and, and we can even uh, send to the telescope comments that, uh, not, not, sorry, not comment. We can create the, the TO in, in, in a way that uh, uh, we, we can easily, uh, um, the observer can easily start observing. Another thing that we can do, of course, is uh, uh, there are many candidates produced by surveys. The, the other approach, the, the, survey, the large uh, wide field surveys, they look for candidates and, uh, and they, they, they find candidates, but many of them are spurious, so we, we need to confirm them. But if we find a, a kilonova, uh, the, the right one, like the, ne the infrared follow-up is a key feature here because uh, the, the kilonova becomes brighter in, 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 in the infrared compared to the, uh, so this color, the optical color, optical versus near color is a very strong uh, discriminant of, of this kind of transients. So it, having a near follow-up uh, available is a major, uh, even a combined uh, infrared optical is a major advantage over other instruments. And of course, uh, uh, for, the, for those cases where, where it's uh, bright enough, uh, spectroscopy and calcification of the, of the features uh, of the kilonova itself. And here I, I show uh, some examples of the, of the uh, 2017 GFO. You see some of the features are very broad. And, uh, and so like it's not really an issue about uh, uh, even a small telescope can, can uh, catch this issue, uh, these features, and maybe capture its evolution, and, and at least in the early stages. So, well, I already mentioned also parts, this is my last slide, uh, where NTE will allow us really to do better because you say, well, if you have observed a 350 gamma ray burst, why do you need to do more? Well, of course, well, the first part that I'm saying is that uh, the higher resolution spectroscopy will uh, give us significant better information compared to what we can do until now. 
and as I say, like the uh, especially uh, covering more to the to the to the infrared uh, will allow to detect features that are not uh, that are redshift out in the in the in the infrared, especially now that SVOM is promising to br to bring many more objects uh, at high redshift. So we really ho hope to uh, populate the uh, the redshift space around five, six, and seven, eight to to get these metallicity uh, studies and it's. Uh, the fact that uh, we should have enough prompt uh, events visible right away from La Palma, it's a, it's a big advantage, even over the VLT in Chile. And uh, again, the infrared, as I just mentioned, is crucial for the Kirillova studies. And uh, one more thing is that, uh, well, practically, the fact of having the instrument available all the time, both in infrared and in optical, is a key advantage. Uh, currently, like we either have Alphosc or Notcom, uh, so uh, the fact that w of having both capabilities at the same time will be, uh, of course, a, a major advantage for, for our object to uh, have intrinsic information spread between the two ranges. So having the two instruments or having the full spectrum available at the same time is, is a key feature. And uh, I see on my screen, end of slideshow, so I'm done. <laughs>